you cannot be whole and reach your potential as a human right. being when you have this cognitive dissonance. If you right. are living a lie, you will not be in the light of the truth. Right. And it affects everything you do, everything you say, everything you think it infects to the point where it can destroy you because you're no longer you. You're an actor playing a role. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are listening to and or watching my podcast, Creatively Called, in conversation with Frank Schaefer. And today I am talking with a friend and someone I admire greatly, and someone whose book I just wrote a forward to, a new book that is out, we're going to be discussing it. And that, of course, is Wayne Besson. And Wayne is the executive director of Truth Wins Out. And he is the author most recently of Lies with a Straight Face, exposing the cranks and cons inside the, quote, ex-gay, end quote, industry. And um, the book is, is wonderful. I wrote what I feel about it in the foreword. I get asked to write forwards sometime because I've had the luck of having a couple of my books sell well, while many others have sunk like stones beneath the waves, never to be seen again. But um, Wayne asked me to write for it, and I was honored because I, I read the book, and it's far, far more than a book about this stupid series of malicious activities we sort of call the, the ex-gay community, you know, brainwashing, all, all this nonsense we're going to be talking about. But it actually goes much deeper than that. And, and Wayne's book talks about the fact that the evangelical community, the Roman Catholic community, many people who call themselves conservatives have really sunk to a new level when it comes to seizing on what you might call an unscience, non-fact-based bigotry that extends not just simply to rejecting gay women and men, but to saying that they somehow have some kind of illness which can be cured if properly treated by their bogus snake oil preparations, camps, books, ministries, etc. And Wayne's really just blown the lid off the whole sordid mess. But it's also a kind of an, an entry point to the entire lie-based industry of the far right. And so it comes with my highest recommendation. I wrote the foreword. I'm going to be talking about it again. But I want to repeat the title one more time of Wayne's book, Lies with a Straight Face, Exposing the Cranks and cons inside the ex-gay industry. So Wayne, welcome. Thank you for coming on. And I'm really looking forward to talking with you. I admire you so much. And I, I'm such a fan of your work. Well, the feeling is mutual. And uh, thank you for the forward. Uh, it's a very important topic. And, and really, uh, you added a lot to the book with the forward. So thank you. It's an honor to be on your show today. My pleasure. So let's just start by um, unpacking a little bit of who you are. I know your history. I'm not going to assume anybody here does. Talk a little bit about yourself as a human, as a person, your background, the ministry, the work that you do for people, and just hold forth. Let us let us find out who you are, and you can be as personal as you want. You certainly don't pull any punches in the book. Um, please introduce yourself to us rather than me doing it. Sure. Uh, I am somebody who cares passionately about defending human rights. What I hate more than anything in this world, and I don't like to use that term often, but I hate bullies. And I don't like those who pick on others and kick those who are down. And I have dedicated my life to fighting for human rights and, and particularly fighting back against those that try to destroy others, bullies. And um, and I started Truth Wins Out, my organization, to monitor the religious right and also to expose the ex-gay industry, because these are the bullies in our society today. Those are the ones that are, you know, you need to change your lifestyle and you're bad. Meanwhile, these hypocrites are doing God knows what. And I, I'm also, you know, on a personal level, someone who enjoys NBA basketball. I love uh, alter alternative rock, classic rock. Um, I like you know, football as well. Miami Dolphins are having a great year so far. Uh, and um, and I listen, love traveling. And mm. um, you know, I live part-time in Medellin, Colombia, and mm. uh, I love the mountains and the beautiful scenery and the tropical birds. Tell us <laughs> so a that's just the beginning. 
Tell us a little more about just the work that you do with Truth Wins Out. Truth Wins Out was started in 2006 after George W. Bush invited ex-gay leaders from now defunct Exodus International to the White House. And the reason he did that was because at the time he was trying to get, he was trying to pass the, the federal marriage amendment and which would have outlawed gay marriage for, forever in the constitution. So he brought these ex-gay leaders, Alan Chambers and Randy Thomas to the White House so they could spread the message. Gay and lesbian people, they don't need to marry. They could just change who they are. They don't need these lifelong commitments to the same sex when the answer is changing through our ministries or our therapy programs and marrying the opposite sex, which of course was to us was absurd as well as very offensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, enough is enough. If these organizations have gotten so powerful that they're in the Rose Garden with the president of the United States, it's time to do something about it. And so I ran to the National Press Club the next day and started Truth Wins Out on, mm -hmm. on, a, on a lark really. Now my background, in this was I had originally with the human rights campaign fought these organizations. I wrote a book called Anything But Straight about this, my original book in 2003. Mm -hmm. And I also photographed John Polk, who was the king of the ex-gay ministries. He was on the cover of Newsweek and key to a campaign called Truth and Love Campaign, that million dollar campaign that advertised ex-gays across the country. And I photographed him in a gay bar exposing him as a fraud in, in 2000. So I had a lot of background going into it, but that's how Truth Wins Out got started. We're, you know, we're doing well today, monitoring reparative therapy, fighting the religious right. And uh, also we took on Ron DeSantis as well. Uh, we fought him because we're uh, based in Florida and uh, our governor is a tyrant as far as we're concerned who likes to kick up, you know, talk about bullies. Is there a bigger bully in politics today than Ron DeSantis, except maybe Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we took on Ron DeSantis as well. And we're very proud of, of that work. You know, it's interesting. Uh, a thought occurred to me, and I'm going to throw this out and take it where you want, but there seems to be such a correlation in my mind between the anti-science stance of the Trump years when it came to the emergence of this whole anti-vaccine subculture as part of his conspiracy theory following, their anti-science, anti-gay, reparative ministry trying to change gay people into straight people as if somehow that's an illness, the anti-science stand of so much of the religious right when it comes to climate change the anti-science stand that I was raised to embrace as an evangelical coming out of that background, basically clinging to Genesis and the explanation of creation and sacrifice there instead of looking at evolution. This thread runs very deep. It's not just when it comes to gay men and women being born gay in the same way that I was born heterosexual as a natural evolutionary phenomena that has always been with us. Right. This denial of reality and labeling any fact you don't like fake news is something that we evangelicals and many conservative Roman Catholics and indeed conservative Muslims and others have imbibed with their mother's milk from the very beginning because we're living in a time when, you know, it's conspiracy theories and choices being made in favor of non-fact-based mm -hmm. views all the way down. So in a funny way, you guys were the canary in the coal mine, because if you look at the history of the anti-gay movement with that you stood against, it is now replicated in everything imaginable and exploded during the Trump years where that same sort of template is now used against fill in the blank. Doctors who tell you the truth about your health, whatever it may be, so I, I just think there's this whole alternative reality that comes out of religious dogmatism that is swamping our culture. And the fight that you have is part of that. And correct me if I'm mistaken, but that's that's just the way I see it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I can pinpoint when this began to occur. I mean, Donald Trump didn't come out of thin air, it didn't come out of nowhere. Hmm. I point to Ronald Reagan when he was trying to get the endorsement of the, the Southern Baptist. Yep. And he said, you can't endorse me, but I can endorse you. Yep. That was the beginning of it. And once the religious right was 
officially brought into this coalition, the moral majority with Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson. It was at this moment that they had to take the unscientific conspiracy theories that came along with this constituency. So from at that point on, to win elections, they had to do things like say, oh, evolution you know, isn't, uh, isn't uh, a fact. That's where it started. As you mentioned, gay and lesbian people, transgender people, the canary in the coal mine. Mm. We see some of the quacks before we saw it with, for example, COVID. We had people like Dr. Paul Cameron on the religious right who would say gays are much more likely to be serial killers and gave fake statistics. He said, uh, there is a molestation happening against young people in the Nebraska, the Omaha, Nebraska mall. Mm. And at one point, a little boy had his penis bit off. I mean, people went crazy, like, oh, my God. Turned out it was all a lie. He just invented this at a whole cloth off the top of his head. And for that, he lost his job at the University of Nebraska. Uh, he was discredited. The American Psychological Association took away his credentials. But they didn't, at that point, the Republican Party and conservatism in general back down from it and say, well, you know what? Maybe it's not the best idea that we embrace this constituency that believes in conspiracy theories, believes in faith healing, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't believe in facts. They believe in how they feel, uh, whether and that. So it went from and, and, and a lot of it was polling, as you know. I mean, this was sure. uh, with gay rights and abortion as well. They weren't against it that much. What it was, it was it was busing and inter integration it had to do with mm -hmm. race. But as we saw race become more acceptable, and you couldn't say the things that you used to do. They had to find new issues. And yeah. so they said they did some polling and found that they could scare people about LGBTQ people. Abortion yeah. was the other big issue. Yeah. And so we were we went on the attack against us around 1979, 1980, about that time. Uh, they used direct mail, which was pioneered by at, the, at that time on the right and to attack. And the result was that it fundamentally changed conservatism politically in the Republican Party, they thought, as, as, as mainstream parties and people often do, that you can embrace the extremists and mold them to fit in and, and, and to uh, become more mainstream over time, to mm -hmm. settle down. But it's always the opposite. They have a lot of passion, and extremists will then take you over. And that is what we saw. And we saw the beginnings of that in 1992, the Republican National Convention with George W. Oh, I'm sorry, George W. George H. W. Bush at the 92 convention in Houston, when Pat, when Pat Buchanan gave his culture war speech, and uh, we also had Pat Robertson there in the audience, and that was really the beginning of uh, a huge cultural shift when science couldn't be adopted by many people in our in the Republican Party, and it just manifested itself. It got worse and worse and worse until we got to. Donald Trump, and that's where we are today. Where, as uh, as um, they said during the Trump administration, uh, Kellyanne Conway, I'll turn to the facts. Mm. Yeah, and of course, one of the points that I've been making during the Trump years and preceding them, and my critiques of what's going on, overlaps directly with what you're saying. In that, I was pointing out that when it came to denouncing any story you don't like as fake news, and then culminating in denouncing the result of a fair democratic election as a as a stolen election right. you know that goes right back to my childhood where i was always told by my evangelical parents basically this and that is fill in the blank whatever they are saying whether it's a teacher a high school student a, a, a friend a scientist the the media that is somehow seen as contradicting what quote we believe trust what we believe without any evidence whatsoever. The most extraordinary claims. Yeah, I just gonna say, because you said extraordinary claims that in, in my book, I talk about a group uh, in Lives with a Straight Face, a group called Change Movement. They're the yeah. leaders in the ex-gay movement today, the largest group. If you wanna talk about extraordinary claims, they're a faith healing cult, Bethel Church in Redding, California. Mm -hmm. They actually believe that not only can you cure being gay, uh, you can also regrow limbs, cure yeah. cancer, all of this. They, 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 they uh, chase down people in the street and try to heal them. If you're walking in Redding, California with a limp, for example, they will almost virtually tackle you. 
yeah. trying to carry, putting their hands all over you and, 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 and molesting you like in the street, trying yeah. to cure you. This is yeah. what the largest ex-gay group, this is the group behind them in Redding, California, in, in Bethel Church. So when you talk, that's where it's gone right now. When you talk yeah. about extraordinary claims, what's more extraordinary than regrowing limbs? If you'll believe that, you'll believe anything. Yeah. You're gullible. Yeah. You know, there's a quote that I want to read. Sorry, this is very self-serving, but I want to read something I wrote in the forward to your book, because I think it sets it up well in terms of a discussion with you. I wrote as Wayne writes in one of the best sentences I've encountered as crafted in the English language, and now I'm quoting your book, I quote, I was forced to construct a cognitive dissonance that divided my soul from my physical being, end quote. I love that sentence, but it describes so perfectly not just your own journey, but mine, not coming out as gay, but I'll put it a different way, coming out as human, and, and science-based, but it also describes everything we're talking about. And that is that the, the fundamentalist community, fill in the blank, Muslim, Christian, Hindu nationalists these days, yes. the whole bit, asks us to basically make a choice. And they give us a cognitive dissonance that divides our souls from our physical being, our physical being grounded in science and reality and breathable air and the climate we live in, as opposed to what we are told is their view of our soul. And there's this kind of tension. And of course, there's so many former evangelicals who understand what I've just said and what you just wrote. And I think it goes so far beyond just the, the fundamentalist denial of reality. And I the reason I keep saying it goes beyond that is that I don't think you are making a case of special pleading for, quote, my group. No. You're making a case for reality, period. Yes. And you cannot be whole and reach your potential as a human right. being when you have this cognitive dissonance. If you right. are living a lie, you will not be in the light of the truth. Right. And it affects everything you do, everything you say, everything you think it infects to the point where it can destroy you because you're no longer you. You're an actor playing a role. Yeah. And... I apply that in the book to uh, ex-gays in the sense I say they haven't changed. They are actors playing a role. But yeah. eventually the final curtain of reality comes crashing down. Yeah. They have to take off their masks yeah. and be themselves again. Yeah. And if they don't, they will drive themselves insane. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the people I quote, uh, former ex-gay leader McCray Game, actually said that. He said, it will drive you insane. It was driving me insane. You cannot... Yeah. You cannot have this cognitive dissonance. It will ruin you. Well, and I think a point of recent history that it comes so so close to the reality we all lived through during the COVID epidemic. You know, I can remember my wife, Jeannie, and I. I mean, I actually shed a tear when I finally had the vaccine. I had been, you know, holed up in my house for a year trying to stay away from this and that person. I was so grateful for this scientific breakthrough. It was going to be able to give us a shot here as an older couple in in the context of people who were basically denouncing the whole vaccination thing as a conspiracy of left-wing radical liberals, you know, you look at the map of where people died and in what numbers, and you look at the map of where the worst health care in the country is, some of it overlaps with racial disparities and iniquities of racism and so forth, but a lot of it overlaps with the people talk about you know, the the internal dissonance yeah. who have denied science to the point that it has actually killed them. And this isn't a made up thing. We're talking tens of thousands of people who died needlessly because they were in church when they should have been at home sheltering. But they made a statement for their God and their belief by going to church anyway without a mask. They didn't get their vaccine. They believed all this BS. So that, you know, what you're saying, and I'm pointing this out to people listening to this podcast, this isn't just about people denying who gay women and men are and trans people are. This is about a view of life that denies reality to the point where literally you're talking about an act. You act a role that is so unhinged right. from reality, it kills you. And of course, yeah. in, in terms of the issue you're raising, that's true too, because there have been people who have committed suicide because they have been forced into this box. Yeah, I, I will add, I mean, you mentioned earlier the, whether it's the uh, Hindu nationalist, uh, in some cases, Jew Jewish extremists and, you know, settlers, you mentioned Muslim yeah. jihadists, 
Christian fanatics that we see in the United States that were at uh, the Capitol January 6th. Mm. They're all connected. They're not that different than they like to pretend. Right. It's about control. It's about controlling society. It's about social domination. Uh, it's about their way or the highway. And that's why all these movements are anti-democratic. Yeah. They're not compatible with democracy. And then you discuss the COVID situation. And to me, that's one of the most heartbreaking matters because this was a triumph of human ingenuity. This was something to be celebrated. Yes. And they turned a life-saving medical treatment into a political football mm. for partisan gain. Yeah. And people died, tens yeah. of thousands of them. And every single day, we would hear stories mm -hmm. of those who chose politics over their health, over their families. And they did die. And I really don't understand the point of someone saying that they're going to church to celebrate God. Well, I, I don't know. It seems to me in all the major religions, God's supposed to be everywhere. So he could have also gone, been in your house. You didn't need to go to church for mm -hmm. this and infect others. It was also solipsism. I mean, this was self-centeredness to a degree that's certainly unbiblical. Um, and you talk about morals and ethics, infecting other people and killing them or mm -hmm. making them sick or suffering with long-term COVID. Yeah. Don't, don't tell me you're a person of faith and, and willing to inflict that on others. Hmm. Uh, it was mind boggling to me. And it's also very dangerous because COVID for all of the horrors of it, and it, it was quite awful, there will be worse path, there, there's going to be worse pathogens. Yeah, exactly. It could be some form of Ebola, for example, or some other new one that we don't have never heard of yet. And what's gonna happen then we're going to have people fighting, trying to deny money in Congress, for example, for vaccines. So we all just get sick and die miserable deaths because they're living in the Middle Ages. They have a medieval mindset and we're mm -hmm. all going to suffer because of it. This is this is severe and this is very scary. And it, it, it sets the stage for a much worse situation for another pandemic. And if we know anything about human history, we know that pandemic pandemics epidemics they come we saw the black plague and what that did to europe yeah covid is for as horrible as it was it wasn't as bad as the black death yeah what happens when we get a pathogen like that and we are having instead to fight for lives we're having to fight uh people who are, have lost their minds and live in another century mm. we should be trying to protect ourselves and instead we're having to waste time and energy on fighting people who want to believe in myths and conspiracies hmm. and have no regard for the truth. And that should scare everybody. I mean, I never thought in my lifetime I would see fights over, over vaccines like this. It's, it's, it's a form of barbarism. And it's people who are not just at war with, say, a political party, but they're hmm. at war with the Enlightenment itself and Enlightenment right. values. Right. And, whether, and, and, and it crosses lines where I said that, that the fundamentalists, whether they're Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, are problematic worldwide, anti-democratic. They live, have medieval mindsets. We also need to form coalitions and work together with people of all those faiths or no faith at all, who are based in rationality and the enlightenment hmm. because we live all over the world. Yeah, and that's you know, how we're going to win. That's how we're going to win. It's interesting you bring up the issue of the, the sort of the black death and, and Ebola and plagues of the future because you know, in, in terms of the history of the Enlightenment itself, it came out of the Renaissance era very clearly. And of course, the Renaissance, in part, mm -hmm. um, in embracing people like Galileo, which, for instance, the Medicis in Florence did, who were leaders in the Renaissance, in part of their embrace of science was a reaction to the medieval mentality mm -hmm. of the Roman Catholic Church and its inability to find any solutions for the Black Death. And they, you know, Lorenzo de' Medici and Cosimo and these others, and thinkers like Galileo were beginning to say, look, this isn't working. And they weren't, they were not, you know, they were not uh, in biology and science that we're in. They were starting to look at the stars and so forth and reconsider certain truth claims of Christianity and the absolutism uh, that went along with this and so forth. But it began to open the door to the kind of research that gave Jeannie and me a vaccine. 
and it was a rejection of of mythology and superstition and we're going to try to find a better way there's an irony in the left these days by the way which i think is a tremendous deficit a kind of an absolutism that says well because these were white men as part of a patriarchy we're going to reject what they thought too wait a minute you know in their moment they were fighting for enlightenment they were saying science is a better way to go and the greater enlightenment we may now have you know somewhat came out of that you know it's very similar to anybody looking at martin luther king jr and criticizing him for not casting what he said in terms that would fly exactly in 2023 and 24 Mm -hmm. um instead of just looking with admiration and gratitude at the doors he opened you know i get a bit annoyed with that that said and that's just a little footnote um if we don't get back to an enlightenment idea that there is a reality out there let's just start with that there's a reality for instance the reality that people are born gay or straight or they're born trans or they come from their various backgrounds and needs in terms of sexuality and preference and all the rest of it, rather than they've chosen this somehow nefarious path that goes against the laws of God. You know, this is very much like the medieval mentality that was looking for what sins a community had committed that they were now being punished with the Black Death. And, you know, let's burn a witch. That'll solve it. There must be an evil person in our community. We'll find them and burn them. This was happening. And the Renaissance said, well, wait a minute, maybe there never were witches and there aren't any now. And there's another reason. Let's try to understand this. And we're there now. And it just is crazy to me that we're having this discussion in 2023. So I, I want to go to my next question and get back to the state of affairs now with the ex-gay industry, which I would imagine in these ministries that you manage is continuing and in some ways becoming more virulent because of the Trump MAGA right which is just in full bore into bigotry now with DeSantis and others. Well, they used to pretend on the right and the ex-gay ministries that they loved us. In fact, when they attacked us in a a giant campaign in 1998, they called it the truth and love campaign. And their tagline was, it's about, it's not about hate. It's about hope. Mm -hmm. Now, thanks to Trump, they don't even bother. They just hate you. Right. That they took, they ripped, they ripped off the facade Mm -hmm. and they will spew the most disturbing horrible things and they will also discuss their own bizarre ideas a demonic uh, 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 they think it's demonic oppression if you're lgbtq they give these right. exorcisms they uh see demons and and, and uh, the devil under every rock and every nook and cranny yeah it's fa- it's faith healing again the biggest ex-gay cult in reading Pen- in reading california uh, california bethel church believes you can regrow limbs and cure cancer and all the other things and cure homosexuality whatever it is and uh, they can cure limping people on the street. That's medieval mindset. That is not compatible with a modern age. Right. And you, you look at what we're facing right now, we have to take back not just our country, but the world for mm-hmm. enlightenment values, rationality, fact-based discussion. And we cannot cede it to those who live in another century. And, um, you know, I, I also think, I mean, you mentioned uh, some of the extremes on the left. Look, the left, I, I'm, very, I'm incredibly progressive, but I, I'm also not blind to the fact that there's a dogmatism that can form on the left as well. For example, you mentioned uh, trying to compare eras. You yeah. trying to say, well, people weren't progressive, to, you know, they, for a couple hundred years ago. Well, of course, it was a couple hundred years ago. You yeah. can't, you can't, you, you can't, sit there and act like uh, somebody from a couple hundred years ago is going to be acting like somebody today. That's called evolution. Hmm. That's the growth of humanity. We, we learn. That's what the enlightenment actually is. It's not that you're never wrong. It's that you'll grow and learn from mistakes hmm. and evaluate them. Hmm. That's what separates, I, I think, these values from the fundamentalists is they don't lo- learn. They don't grow. They're always right. They're never wrong. We saw with Trump and and uh, George W. Bush, to some extent, never an apology for anything. We won't apologize. We won't learn. We won't grow. I, I think that's the difference in the mindset. And and yeah. I think that's a very dangerous and catastrophic mindset that will lead to possibly the end of humanity because of what we're facing with climate change. Yeah. We, we, have, we cannot save the human race. We cannot save humanity with looming climate change if we do not come together and look at the facts. We know what the facts are right now. Hmm. Are we evolved enough as a species to do something about it? Yeah. Or is it going to be too late? Because 
I think the evidence is pointing to we're not going to do anything about it right now. We mm-hmm. see the summer is getting hotter. And so we, we saw what happened this summer. Yeah. We see the rivers and, and lakes drying up in front of us. We see the extreme weather, the unpredictability. Mm-hmm. We, see, we see what the scientists are saying. And uh, we have a, a large percentage of the population that acts like the scientists and the data are just another opinion, one of many opinions out there. Mm-hmm. That's going to get us all killed quite frankly, and have no future. Uh, We can save ourselves, but it's going to take, again, these enlightenment values of fact-based knowledge. Mm. And I I think the right gets wrong about that approach is they think that, oh, you're praying, you turn science into a new God. No, we fully acknowledge that scientists and science can be wrong. But what makes science science is the acknowledgement of that. And then using that data to go towards something that is correct. You build upon it. That's, That's the scientific method not the scientists themselves are what we, um, that is the God, so to speak, and that it's, it, it is, lear- it's, the, it's the dependence on learning and growing from, from the learning that separates, mm. I think, uh, those of us who want to live in uh, a enlightened society versus those who want to return us to the dark ages. Yeah, and I want to reintroduce my guest here. You are listening to and or watching a podcast by me, one Frank Schaefer, author and commentator, and my guest today is my friend Wayne Besson, and I've written the foreword to his new and wonderful book, Lies with a Straight Face, Exposing the Cranks and Cons Inside the Ex-Gay Industry, and we will link to the book, and we will link to Wayne, and you don't have to get a pencil out and note anything down, because anywhere this podcast shows and or is played, you will be able to find links to Wayne, and you will be able to find links to the organization he is the director of, which is Truth Wins Out. And uh, that said, I want to move forward and ask you a question that my producer Ernie just texted me in the chat section here. Does this climate emergency lend itself to the rights doubling down to the rights doubling down on quote unreality? I think it's going to get us all killed in terms of a civilization. We're already seeing the results of that. I mean, mm. I'm I'm from Florida. We see places, garages flooding that weren't flooding before. And it's not even raining, it's just the tides. Right. We know it's happening. I mean, there's, there's no question about it right now. There's no scientist virtually that's not getting paid by the petroleum industry at the expense of humanity mm. that says that we don't have an issue. And we all know what that is. We need to cut down the the the, the carbon in the air. We need we know what to do about this. Yeah. We have some technology if we all come together to do it. Yeah. But we have a section of society that's not insignificant, that's politically powerful, that controls one of the two parties in the United States, who is more interested in scoring political points than solving the greatest issue of our time. Mm that is before us. And I do not think they're capable of change. We're all gonna to have to have form coalitions together of the rational and reasonable, those who are fighting doctrine and dogma. Hmm. Or we are not going to solve it and we're gonna see a scale of suffering and death that we have never seen before. Hmm. And there's no question about, about this. And so, it's hard for people to, I think, conceptualize this and move quickly. It's something that happens slowly. Yeah. But hey, you have a hundred, you know, you have hundred ten degree days for thirty, you know, Phoenix for for over thirty days. Come on, folks, what are you going to wait till it's one hundred and fifty? And we saw that it hit about one hundred and fifty degrees in, in in Iran. Yeah. This year, our bodies aren't made for that. Yeah. We have to act. We have to act, and we just cannot wait around for these mindsets, these medieval mindsets that, that yeah. see, they don't care because they think that oh, we're going to we're going to go to heaven. Right. Or the, the rest of us, apocalyptic the, judgment and so, yes. be it, so forth. Yeah. The rest, the rest of us, the rest of us, we like it here. You know, mm. you can go to heaven if you, if that's your religion, fine. If you want to go, Hey, I like my life. Mm. I'm not, I, I, you know, you want to, you want to be uh, you know, martyred away. That's your problem. Personally, yeah. I, 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 I'll wait to my natural death. I don't, I don't want, climate change to to be it or or because we're fighting vaccines i die Mm. early or get or get sick and my life is impacted and uh we need to be aggressive and fight back i mean i I think we're too passive about this we need to stop 
allowing these fanatics, these extremists, to have such a role in society, and it's increased, it's increased exponentially with social media. Hmm. And we need to do something about it and join together because if if we don't, they're going to, you know, they're going to get their wish. They're all going to get to go to, you know, yeah, and are get, they are getting die. there. They're already getting their wish. Yeah. I mean, it's a self-made, man-made apocalypse, a fulfillment the of COVID. Us a circular yeah. fulfillment of prophecy. You know, I just want to make a comment on Wayne's book, um, Lies with a Straight Face, Exposing the Cranks and Cons Inside the Ex-Gay Industry. I think you could read that title and think, oh, well, you know, this isn't my issue. And uh, I know what I think already about it. But I just want to point something out that I kind of mentioned in the foreword. Um, and then I'll, I'll move on here. But this is a plug, but it's a, a, a very sincere one. And that is that, Wayne, I felt one of the things you did in your book was provide a kind of template of taking one example of the dysfunction of the anti-science right, delving into it, but in a way that opens a window on understanding the entire dysfunction. So if someone said to me, name three books that really explain present day dysfunction in America brought on by the Republican party, by the religious right, I would say, well, weird thing, the title is very specific, lies with a straight face, exposing the cranks and cons inside the ex-gay industry. Sounds like it's about that. Actually, it's not about that. That is a template, a lens through which to look at a far bigger problem. And let me give an analogy. It's like a, a book on the rise and fall of the Third Reich. Okay, there might be a book about that that's strictly history, or it might be a way to look at the rise and fall of all authoritarian, inhuman, fascist dictatorships. And you've written that kind of book. So I would just like to recommend the book and just say, if you want to understand our present moment of history, buy and read Lies with a Straight Face, because you will better understand the anti-vaccine movement. You will better understand who Trump was. You will better understand the background I came from, Frank Schaefer with my father, Francis Schaefer, theologian. You will better understand the journey of every former evangelical or strict Roman Catholic or Mormon or Muslim who has moved beyond that. You'll understand the women in Tehran who are being arrested for taking off a headscarf because that too is pushing back against false lies of a Muslim theocracy. And if you want to know the moment we're in, buy and read Wayne's book, because, you know, like, like the environment, you know, the scientists tell us that our brains can't compute changes that are so huge, you know, six million dead or a billion this and that. But if it's one story, you get it. Read Wayne's story and through Wayne's story, understand a far bigger story. So that's the end of my little plug here. But I well, really mean that. But, but Frank, Frank, I'm glad you mentioned that because you can't it's not just about one specific issue, the ex no. industry. I explain through history and current events how we got to a place where people believe such inanities. Yes, you do. And it, you can't, just like you mentioned when the, with Iran and with the women who are being oppressed there, the, the ex-gay industry, which is funded by the religious right, the Southern Baptist Convention, the Pentecostals, yeah. they, they, as part of their dogma and doctrine they say that they you know a man must be the lion of the den sure. for example they say that head, head of the home head of the home yes a woman a woman must be submissive this is if you're going to believe in this ex-gay rhetoric you have to believe in this it's yeah. all part of the same issue you would not have gotten to the point where the religious right embraced this pray away the gay issue if it weren't for all of the other factors you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So they're all connected. And I could not have written this book specifically narrow cast to this one issue. It had to be within the context of broader history and social mm. uh, and social issues. And and um, and I was it was that was the most important thing for me to write the book in that way. And that's why I think people will enjoy it, as you as you pointed out, because it's the marriage of, of uh, politics history, religion, social issues, and uh, I think contemporary uh, time we're in. How did we get here? What is it about? And I think the book I, I, I makes a very strong effort to, um, to, to, to put this one issue in a broader context. And that yeah. was important to me. And I think, I think the moment we are in screams for this book, because of course, the moment we are in and something that I've been yelling about for a long time now and trying to warn people about and have not been successful at warning people about because here we are and obviously nobody was listening, but that we are in a worldwide competition between theocrats of all kinds and those who believe in science, democracy, and human rights. 
period. That's the battle, whether it's a girl being raped in a police station in Tehran because she took her headscarf off or fill in the blank, the latest young kid who was bullied to death in a home that rejects gay people or sent off to some stupid summer camp that was supposed to heal her of the gay. This is all the same story. And it's a story of a competition between the, the fruit of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, whether it was a bunch of white men or not. The fact of the matter is they had some good ideas. Sorry, that's the truth. Um, that then, by the way, grew into the feminist movement that rejects them because they really believed in freedom and that's what they set loose. So, you know, a plug for Galileo here and a few people like him. But uh, aside from that, I think the point of your book is well taken. And that is that we are now in a cataclysmic moment of history where we have a choice between science and facts. Okay, I'm going to be melodramatic here or death. And, and it's the death of environmental destruction. Um, and it's the death of war without end, nor new wars of religion. That, that's what's ahead of us. And, and, and Wayne's book lays it all out. I, I want to go to a note here that my um, producer sent in a very good one here, which was ex-gay industry uh, is a word you use. The, the erasure of the entire peoples is a business of the far right and has been for a long time. And, you know, what we see there is a sort of a template that Trump made such good use of. And I kind of semi facetiously say, well, of course, evangelicals follow Trump because he reminds him so clearly of their televangelists who were always raising a buck. So if he's indicted, the next thing he's doing is selling a T-shirt with his with his photograph taken in a in a in a in a police station when he was arrested. Um, let's cash in on everything. We've seen that before. So talk for a minute just about the con artist part of this. Forget the issue, but just how it's become a money-making machine. It's a way, it's like the abortion fight, quote unquote, that I was in in the 1970s and 80s with my dad. A lot of, a lot of evangelicals signed on who had actually been pro-choice when Roe came down because right. there was money there was money to be made by the rage machine yeah people don't know that people think that, that the uh the right that the evangelicals were always you know fervently anti-abortion no if you look back at the publication southern baptist even at the time it was much more moderate than it even became. christianity today magazine yes. reverend billy graham the evangelist they refused to join my dad's and my fight against abortion because they said they were pro-choice who, who knew people don't yeah, know I, that today what you mentioned, and you, you were talking about the, the Trump, the evangelicals, obviously Trump is far from a religious man. I mean, he's sure. if you wanted to show the opposite, that would be him, but they believe in him, the evangelicals. Yeah. And he gets, what is it, 80 plus percent of the white male evangelical vote, and similar with, with women, mm. uh, not much less. What are, they, what are they in the business of, Frank? I tell you what they're in the business of, it's the same thing. They sell certainty. Yeah. Those are what they sell. I'm never wrong. This is the way it is. Listen to me. I know the best. Oh, Trump, I alone can fix it. That's very similar, as you pointed out, to these evangelical preachers. Mm -hmm. They also are in the business of doubt, creating doubt about people they don't like. Yeah. And so certain certainty and doubt, that is what they have in common. Yeah. And it's a, it's a very dangerous phenomenon. You mentioned why I call it an industry, the ex-gay industry. Mm. I met uh, Bethel Church. The one with changed movement, they they have over sixty million dollars annually in revenues. Sixty million dollars is behind this this ex gay organization sure. selling this garbage. Uh, but prior to that, focus on the family was the big leader in pushing conversion therapy. Well, and they Frank had so much. Graham has played this game. Yes, all it's all big money. Yeah, trying to sell certainty and doubt about other people. Yeah, and the ex gay. It's just a product to them. They don't believe it. And I think I pointed that in, out in my book, and I, I made right. sure that was that the former ex gay leaders, the people who were on the inside, who were planning and executing this, saying that they had gone from gay to straight through you know, the power yeah. of Jesus Christ, now that they're out of the closet, now that they renounce what they had done in the past, mm. they will tell you that the religious right, the leaders do not believe the message they are selling. They do not believe that gay people can change privately, but they right. know there's too much money in it and it's too much political power. They cannot yeah. admit the truth and they're willing to harm millions of LGBTQ people, especially youth, yeah. 
well, you know, the the, high suicide rates that they don't they don't care because it's more it's it's an industry. Yeah. And there's a direct parallel with the Saudi royal family that every time Khashoggi or someone wrote honestly about them and then he got murdered for doing it. You know, these guys live one life when they're in their apartment in New York, Paris or London, and then they put on their robes and do the the you know, the God shuffle in in Saudi Arabia and persecute women who ask for basic rights. Um, it's exactly the same thing. You know, when you look at the when you look at demagogic leadership across the globe, mm-hmm. Putin, Trump, all these people, they have one thing in common, and that is the manipulation of the true believer for power and and money. And so Putin winds up as the richest man on earth. Sorry, Elon Musk, but apparently that's the fact. And Trump is, is, you know, denying that he lost an election. And every time he's prosecuted criminally, he raises more money with it. You know, these guys are all cut from the same piece of cloth. And I really do think, all joking aside, that a lot of white evangelical voters were kind of knee-jerk chained to believe their pastor no matter what happened. You know, he can come back and repent of the fact that he was screwing around with his secretary and left his wife and start a new ministry. He can, you know, raise more money now on a repentance thing. It's a machine and it's the big God business that I was in one time was the, you know, was the only time that I earned quite a bit of money. And after I left it as a young man, I earned a lot less. I've been there and tasted that well. And I know it's addictive. It took a lot of of anguish to get out of that for me. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I don't think that the similarity between these religious trapping leadership, Modi in India, the Saudis, the mullahs, the evangelical leadership in America, the conservative Roman Catholic bishops, when they're not being prosecuted for child molestation themselves or covering up for priests that are, a lot of these guys are cut from the same piece of cloth. It's a kind of a con artist profiteering. And that's why I think the it's very key in your book that the ex-gay industry, you talk about, you know, the erasure of people's freedoms, but it's for profit. And there's a cynicism to that, which then goes to another level of awfulness, I think, when it comes to the leadership. I'd like you to comment on that. Well, Putin is a perfect example, and you, you mentioned him. Here is someone who has been very tied to the church and presents mm. himself as a man of family values. Well, yeah. he's a war criminal who murders innocent civilians, blows up cafes. Uh, he is someone who kidnaps children, takes them back to Russia. He is someone who has, war, has engaged in a horrible war against people who just want to be free. Yeah. What's, reli- what's religious or godly about this person? And uh, you know, Russia, he presents as this great family value society. Well, you know what? I've lived many years in New York and I still live in Florida in Miami Beach. And it's just like, filled with Russians that aren't quite living as Putin had said about yeah. great family values, uh, a lot of parties, a lot of drugs, a lot of you know, sex. I and mean, who are they kidding? And it's like that was you mentioned with the Saudis as well. I see them in New York and, and, and in, in Miami, same, same ball game, doing the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, it's about a front. It's about money. And the fuel for all of this is fear. Yeah. Yeah. Putin, the, the, he creates fear that the Ukrainians are Nazis. Fear. Donald Trump, the fear of uh, the, the liberals, the media, you name it, uh, those um, who are opposed to him. Every, anyone is, uh, he goes after, gay people. Yeah. Uh, they're all, it's all, they're all, it, it, it's about scaring people and then presenting themselves as the answer through certainty. That yeah. is how they gain control. And you would be, you would hope that more people would see through it by now. And they'd understand that it slows down progress in humanity. It leads to destruction. When you start attacking people, they you know, eventually fight back. Yeah. And you stop with breakthroughs. Hmm. You get stuck in place. Society, if it does not outright crumble, it erodes. Yeah. And that is what we are seeing in much of the world today because yeah. of these figures that have yeah. arisen and we live in a scary time. I think social media has made it a lot scarier. Yeah. Uh, we have we have propaganda networks like uh, Fox News. Hmm. Um, you know, to a lesser degree, you'll find some on the left, but I think yeah, I think on the right today it's much worse. But there's nothing the equivalent of Fox, for example, right wing talk radio today. Yeah. It's about, oh, these people are bad and they're out to get you. They're gonna harm you unless you you join up and fight back yeah. and stop them. And 
you know what? It's nonsense, but if you can terrify people hmm. that others are out to get them, they will react like they are today. If you can scare people into believing that a bunch of sinister scientists are trying to inject microchips into your arm for a yeah. vaccine, yeah. well, then then you can control them and vote and get their votes. And they're certainly their money, as, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the money thing disturbs me. The left does not fund their movements properly. Mm. And it's a disgrace. And we may lose because of it. I got to be blunt. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I, mean, I mentioned Bethel. I, I'm the, the the organization that leads fighting the conversion therapy and monitoring them. And we have a small budget. Yeah. The group I'm fighting, Change Movement, 60, come from a, a church with 60 million a year. I just, I just exposed a hypocritical ex-gay therapist last week in Virginia, Christopher Doyle. He runs, get this, Frank, the Institute for Healthy Families. Well, I got a tip about it. He runs, yeah, he runs the Institute for Healthy Families. I got a tip in his divorce papers. He was arrested for pushing his mother-in-law. Uh, his wife accused of attacking him. He was accused of, of choking his children in these divorce papers and having a uh, what appears to be potentially an affair with one of his clients where his client was calling him daddy, a gay affair, and he's supposed to have been you know, killed. His client was calling him daddy, and he was calling this grown man boo-boo. I don't know. That doesn't sound like... But this guy, you know, the Institute of Healthy Families, is the least healthy family man in the country. But in the divorce records, he was making over $200,000 a year hmm. trying to cure gay people, having zero success, ruining hmm. lives. And But, you know, they fund their people. They have think yeah, tanks. But they've got, they've got radio break. stations. Yeah. And scandals break and nothing changes because the faithful then excuse it and go forward. And, you know, you, you wonder after Jerry Falwell Jr. and the pool boy incident and, you know, paying to film him having mm -hmm. sex with the pool boy and so forth. Oh, no. You know, he leaves the school full pension. No problem. He still still gets a buck uh, from from yeah. the organization and the board doesn't do anything about it. And, and do any of those lovely, you know, um, evangelical Christian students leave in protest no they just all stick around par for the course on we go donald trump could you know do what he said he was going to do which is shoot somebody on fifth avenue and yep they'd still follow him um and and so there's a there's a kind of a culpability and cynicism there once you accept this idea that all news that doesn't corroborate your point of view is fake news then of course there's no leverage to have a real discussion anymore because everything can be dismissed right. as other sides propaganda and that's where we are today on all these all these issues well that's why they consciously cultivate that idea of sure. all news against them being fake news so they can do horrible things and they could be hypocrites and yeah. tell their flock or their followers to act one way and they do another as donald trump regularly does or christopher doyle who i just exposed yeah uh, i mean i think we still try to expose them to help people see through it who are able to uh, yeah. Well, we have no expectation these days that they'll be held accountable right. by their religious movements. They call themselves you know, people of God or are conservatives, and but I, I don't really see anything conservative or, or particularly uh, faith-based about the way they behave. Uh, yeah. It seems it seems often in, in terms of the Christian right that I have to fight that they ask, "What would Jesus do?" and they only ask so they can do the opposite. Right. Right. Yeah, it's kind of a giveaway. As soon as you hear someone say, well, what would Jesus do about something like this? You you know you're in trouble. You know, years ago when I was on my way out of the evangelical community, before I bailed, but the first sort of step for me was writing a book, which I guess was fairly influential with a lot of younger creative people who were in music and other things called Addicted to Mediocrity, about basically turning everything into a message as a propaganda vehicle rather than trying to tell the truth about anything and let the chips fall where they may. And looking back, you know, that was the beginning of my journey out was you might also you might almost say a matter of artistic aesthetics in the sense that if art is just to serve propagandistically to bolster what it turns out to be a lie, you know, the next step is this fake news thing. And, you know, we ought to be on a common sense basis. You'd think a lot of these guys running around wearing MAGA hats would be suspicious of anyone that pitches you anything who comes at it by saying anything bad you hear about me is a lie, period. If you hear something bad about me, you can assume this is fake. You know, 
that doesn't work in human relations. You know, if you told, if I told my wife, you know, any, any time you tell me something about myself, I need to change. I'm just assuming you're lying or any fact that contradicts some truth claim of mine. You know, if I say I've, 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 I've taken all the dishes out of the dishwasher and put them away and they happen, the dishwasher still happens to be full of dirty dishes or they're sitting on the sideboard, you know, that that's fake news because it doesn't bolster my vision. No one accepts that on any level. And yet the entire evangelical community in voting for Trump has basically adopted the idea that anything we find out that's bad about Trump or any of our positions are not verified. Say we find out there's a scientific point of view about who gay people are and how they got that way in the same way there is about heterosexual sexuality and so forth. It, it, you know, it, it boggles me because a lot of these people, when it comes to ordinary life, are sensible people. But in the area of the ideology, they've taken a jump into a kind of another world, which is impossible to sustain in reality. Well, I call it lying for the Lord, mm. that they, they can justify it. They have a goal, which yeah. they have been told, and anything is justifiable to get there. Yeah. No matter how horrible or heinous it might be. And that is why we have seen such awful behavior. And it's getting worse because there's less accountability. It's getting mm -hmm. worse because of this permission structure that's been created by their leader, social media. And Trump certainly was a huge accelerant mm -hmm. where they can also do horrible things, be nasty, be rude. Yeah. Um, not, and we're seeing the, the logical conclusion of it, for example, in Congress right now, where the Republicans have gone so far to the extreme that they can't even elect a speaker mm. and anybody who is elected speaker is on thin ice because yeah. the problem with all of these fundamentalisms and right you know christian muslim whatever it may be and i'll extend it to some on the left when they become dogmatic about certain things and we've seen it on the left as well because I, I to be fair not quite to the extent on the right today is that when you get into a purity contest, mm. you will eventually destroy yourself because nobody's ever going to be pure enough for you. Right, right. And that is what we see on the right today. And we've seen examples, you know, on the left as well, um, un unfortunately, when th it's my way or the highway, I will not compromise. I, I am self-righteous. You have nothing to offer society. When you start getting into that mindset and looking at people in that way, and it only can lead to strife. It only, but it's going to eventually going to come back and blow back on you. And you're eventually, it's going to destroy you. And, and, and um, I mean, I think Trump's many of his advisors right now who bought into that or now they're facing jail time or, or fines or what it yeah. may be are, are seeing that. We're, we're seeing the dysfunction politically right now. But, but nobody's going to win in the end of this because uh, even Trump got booed, for example, when he... Uh, spoke out about an issue, um, it was it immigration, or he, he was booed at a rally once when he, he had created a situation where, um, he created a situation where, where he, he, he was so extreme that even he was a heretic sure. in the end. Everyone's a heretic in the end when you have a movement based on purity yeah. and, 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 and perfection. And that is what, uh, why it cannot succeed as, a, as a, either a theology or, or a mm. political ideology. Mm. Well, I am hoping that um, people will read the book because, as I said, it's a lens through which to see a much bigger issue. Um, and, and kind of a last question for you before we end this, Wayne, is um, again from Ernie, my producer, who sends me wonderful things. Um, Wayne is using his voice and platform to speak out against the cynical clownery. What more can the rest of us do? How do we encourage more of our friends and neighbors to come out of every closet of lies, whatever the closet is. Um, and what have you found to help people come out of the, these, these closets to work? Um, and then lastly, at, in addition to that, I would just simply ask you, okay, we're gonna wrap this up in a minute, but I wanna make mm -hmm. sure that there's not something that you were hoping to get said here that I've forgotten to ask the pertinent question. So ask that question, answer Ernie's question, because it's a good one. You know, how do we come out of our closets and, and what is there still to, to do on that? But then lastly, is there something that you want to add to this discussion that I failed to draw out? 
I'll quote uh, uh, the, the late uh, Larry Kramer, who was an AIDS activist and cantankerous, very, very, uh, you know, I liked him, but he's very cranky, he could be cranky. Mm. And somebody came up to him and said, oh, I admire you so much for all you're doing. You're fighting for us. And he looked at him and said, F you, you should be doing it too. Yeah. And that, that's my advice. Yeah. What each person should ask themselves, what am I doing? Yeah. First of all, are you voting? Mm. There are differences. In, in each politician, the ones, are you holding them accountable? Are you showing up? Are you volunteering? Whether it be school board, are you running for office? What are you doing for our society? And even if you're busy, you can speak out if you see something, an injustice. Mm. You don't, I, I, I would also add that we need to be more thoughtful. We've gotten to a place where it's reductive to the point, and I, you know, I've been guilty of it too, I, I, you know, but, but we have to reverse that in a way and look at and look at issues from a point of science, a point of, of, of truth, a point of examination. And if it involves our own flaws, we need to, I think, uh, become better. Hmm. Because, it, because if we go down this route that we're going and it's gonna to lead to nothing, but strike. That doesn't mean not fight. We need to fight like hell and call out injustice. But it doesn't mean it also means we're not always right. Hmm. And we've gotten to a place now where it's just like everybody is right. Nobody's going to admit that they're wrong in any case. And so I think we have to have a little humility. Yeah. Be humble sometimes. Um, so that's my advice. Everybody's got a role to play. Don't depend on anybody else. Be a good citizen when it comes to voting or running for office or again, just speaking out or mm. raising your children in a way that's loving and accepting and also educating ourselves. There's so much propaganda that's out there today, mm. but we can't be passive bystanders. We have to, we can't just accept things mm -hmm. passively. We need to examine if we're told something that we need to, to, to do a little research, not like the kind of fake research that COVID deniers to put real research mm. from credible sources. So we're more educated and can see through the flim flam yeah. and the con artists and the charlatans, because there's no shortage of them today. But we have a personal responsibility to, to, to do that. Mm. Um, and, lo and, 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 you know, and I'll go all hippie at the end. And how about a little more love? Yeah. Uh, love the, the, you know, I'm not religious, but the, the basic of the good part of every religion is love thy neighbor. Yeah. Love that, you know, you're not going to, maybe not, I don't, I'm not going to love my neighbor or one of them plays music too loud, but yeah, you can be a little more decent, at least if you can't outright love them, you know, at, at least um, have a little humanity. And mm. that's, that's what I think our responsibility is. And I think yeah. if everybody did that, I think maybe we live in a much better world and one where we could solve some of these seemingly untractable pro mm. uh, un problem, you know, problems we face. Mm. Intractable, rather. Yeah, intractable, intractable and untractable. Yeah. I've been in conversation with uh, Wayne Besson, who is the author of a new book that I wrote the foreword to, and it is called Lies with a Straight Face, Exposing the Cranks, Cons Inside the, and Cons Inside the Ex-Gay Industry. It's out today. And as I said, and I will say one more time, it is a lens through which to look at a far bigger global phenomena. And I would really recommend the book, and I hope you get it. Hey. And, wait, yeah. and speaking of global, it's uh, the book's available globally, and, and it has local yes. distributors in all across. We just had sold eleven copies a few minutes ago from the UK, for Good. example. So Go everybody, know, yeah. So all around the world, you can yeah. find lies with a straight face. And all around the world, people do listen to this podcast or watch it as well. So we, we in our tiny little way, are global, and I hope we bring some attention to the book. You can get in touch with Wayne and his organization, Truth Wins Out, by links we will post everywhere. You can buy the book with links we will post everywhere. We've done everything we can. If you don't get the book now, it's your fault. We've done what we can. And Wayne, I thank you for being on with us today. As ever, you are uh, prophetic in what you say, and I really feel humbled and, and, and grateful that you came on today. Well, the feeling's mutual. You have done so much and, and uh, enlightened so many minds, and I really love your work. So thank you so much Thanks. for having me today. We'll do it again. Thanks. Take care, Wayne.